Hello everyone, I am here with the amazing Wild Store, the author of the Status Game, the game of life and how to play it. Will, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Alex. It's great to be here. We've all been touching some part of the elephant, right? The game we play, but I feel like your book really taught, has the real picture of what we're doing in life, which is playing a status game. So, you know, the first thing I want to ask you is, when did you first notice that our North Staras society was to play status games? Um... That's a good question. Yeah, it was kind of a slow. Um, it, it was kind of a slow uh, uh, realization. You know, I, I, I was. You know, there were, I was reading some sort of studies about the importance of um, status, but I, but I, I think the, re the 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 thing that really um, made me think about it in a new way, and that's and that's. Because it's it's one thing to understand. Okay, so status is really important to people, but I think the breakthrough to me was that we're playing multiple games, and our games are different. That that was what made me think. Oh, hang on a minute, and 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 you know, one of the um one of one of the points of realization was actually reading the book Sapiens and disagreeing with something that um Harari was saying there. Um, you know, I used to teach storytelling for a, a long time. I still do teach storytelling, the science of storytelling, and um when sapiens came out it drove me mad everybody going you gotta read this book sapiens man you gotta read this book sapiens and it drove me so mad i kind of refused to to read it <laughs> so i'm not going to read the book sapiens but i eventually read the book and um and it was great but but there was this thing he's he, i didn't really like um agree with what he was saying about storytelling you know he, he was saying that um the, the car com like a, a company like peugeot is a story and if you take all the p people who work for peugeot away from Peugeot there's nothing left it's just a story and I just think it was not a story <laughs> like Peugeot isn't a story I know what a story is and there's this what is not a story but then that made me think of course so what is it like if Peugeot isn't a story well, what is it and then I thought well um what it is is a, is a tribe you know that's what it is it's a it's a tribe and we've got these tribal brains and 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 what what having a tribal brain means is that time and time and time again we do the same thing which is which was which was we um which was we collect into groups, cooperative groups, in order to overcome obstacles, you know. Um, and so, so, so Persia isn't a story, it's a tribe. And how that tribe works is, is a status game. You know, all, all tribes have these hierarchies of um, status in them, where the person at the top gets most of the resources and most of the influence and the person at the bottom gets the least and there are variations in between and that and that's true of hunter-gatherer tribes that's true of pre-modern tribes today it's true of Peugeot it's true of every human group that, um, that you want to imagine even ones that claim they're hierarchy free you know like they're not hierarchy free um so so, 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 so that's where that's where it really began it was it was with this disagreement with something that I read in Sapiens <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course and it's the first time I've ever listened in this podcast from someone from a guest that they don't agree with sapiens well, right? so it's a fresh perspective well with all due respect to him i mean he's sold millions of books more than i have so may maybe maybe he's the smarter one but, but that, that was that was my response to it anyway yeah i know and it's spot on to be honest there's so many themes that you were you touched on right now that i just there's so many ways that i can begin the the conversation but so status is something that is inherent in us. You argue that this is something that we're born with and then through time and with childhood and then adolescence and then mid-20s, it just starts exploding our desire for status. So is it really the case that our desire to, you know, climb the hierarchical ladder is a construct or is it really in our blueprint, in our evolutionary blueprint? It's entirely in our evolutionary blueprint. It's older than it's older than humanity itself. Like we've been interested in status since before we were human. The, the anim, you know, the creatures, the animals, the pre-human animals from, from which we evolved were, you know, interested in, in status. Um, you know, when we became human, we started playing status games in different ways. You know, I think before before we settled down, um, uh, it, you know, around the campfire and became cooperative, um we like most um animals were mostly playing dominance games so that's using threat violence um aggression and and then when we settled down uh, we, went through this, we went through this process of domestication so you know you can't be living in a settled group um and playing dominance games because everyone ends up terrified injured dead you know like it doesn't doesn't work in group in intensely cooperative group 
environments. Um, so, 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 so we had to find new ways of um, playing status games, and 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 so we we came upon these prestige forms of status. Um, um, but 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 yeah, so it's it's been there for a, 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 as long as our recognizably human brains have been evolving, a, a, and for longer. And indeed, you know, like in, in the book, I talk about the, you know, the research of de- developmental psychologists that talk about, you know, very young children who um, begin fighting over toys in the, you know, in, 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 and, and, you know, what they say is you know, they're not really fighting over the toy. They, they, what they understand is whoever has the toy has the status and that's what they're fighting over. Wow. And there's this great line in, in a Bruce Hood book where he, where he writes that this is just practice for, you know, you know, adult life This because this is what adult life is too. <laughs> It's so interesting, this tension that there is between the instinctual side of our nature, that is, you know, the evolutionary code that is embedded in us, versus what you argue that we're just playing imaginary games. So Mm. that the way that I try to make sense of it is that there is this deep instinctual desire to Mm. be at the top of the hierarchy and we can go deep into why do we want this and what are the benefits of it in terms of well-being, Mm. longevity, sexual reproduction, all of those Mm. aspects. But there is this idea that we rationalize the games we play. So like in the 21st century, we try to play white collar games. You know, we, we no longer, the the added value of killing a lion in the wild is just non-existent. So, how do you make sense when you were writing your book, The Status Game, of this constant tug of war between our instincts and the way we rationalize the status game? The way I kind of understand it is that it is that there are kind of two ways that we do life. And there's the con- it's the conscious way and the subconscious way. And the, the conscious experience of life is a story. You know, we 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 are heroes in the in the center of the world and we do what we do because we believe in god uh, we want to or, or we believe in this political aim we we, we you know we, we have all these noble heroic goals um but the subconscious reality of life um is is that we're playing is that we're playing these games and the subconscious reality you know a lot of it's hidden from us um and so that that, that that's not to say that um um uh, people who you know play religious status games uh, aren't doing it because they sincerely believe in god because they do but 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 there's but but what psychologists um differentiate between is what they call um ultimate and proximate motivations so your proximate motivation is what you know why have you gone and ordered a domino's pizza tonight and I, and I'll say oh because I love pizza I'm starving domino's pizza's delicious <laughs> I love it and so that's the proximate reason I've ordered the pizza because dominate because pizza is delicious. The ultimate reason, though, is because evolution has wired me to crave carbohydrate, sugar, and all those things that were so hard to come by in the, in you know, in the wild. So, 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 so the status urge, you know, is subconscious and it's ultimate. You know, p- p- people do what they do because they, you know, often because they love what they're doing what they're doing, but they're driven p- to pursue it. They're driven to um, be perceived as kind of a high value participant in that pursuit because there's a basic fundamental subconscious rule and that is go for status if you go for status everything else gets better like in the tribes in which we evolved higher status people got better food more food safer sleeping sites they got better conditions of life for their children they got a greater access to their choice of mates so everything involved with your survival and reproduction gets better when your status goes up. So it's a very, very simple algorithm the brain knows and has known for hundreds of thousands of years and more. Go for status. And it's true now. It's true. It's true everywhere you go. The, you know, you mentioned imagination. And I think what, what makes humans such an incredibly weird and fantastic animal is that we do have these, these mad imaginations. So animal status games are quite simple. It's often dominance. It's sometimes prestige, you know, um, um, a, a wise elephant matriarch um, um, leads their, you know, younger, more ignorant elephants to water sources. So, so that's a prestige form of status. But, 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 um, but, but humans have these incredible imaginations, which means we can we can play status games with almost anything. 
And so people think when people think of status, they often think of just money and fame. But money and fame are just two ways that we can measure status. Every game has its own ways of measuring what status is. You know, if you if you're in Wall Street, yeah, it's money and it's your suits and it's your you know your your briefcase or your handbag or whatever whatever it might be. But if you're a you're you're, you're a like an ascetic or you're a, you know in the Buddhist monk game, it's it, it it's not it's 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 how much you can do without. How simple can your life be? It's the opposite of the Wall Street game. The way they're measuring status is, is opposite, but it's still a status game. There's still a hierarchy of um, status in that group, depending on how well you perform by its rules. It made me think of the spiritual gurus, you know, that say, I'm not attached to my desires. I'm not attached to any status seeking goals. But then again, those, like you say, that feeling of, being able to be higher rank in those games that in and of itself is a status game. So like it's a, it's a paradox, you know, those who tend to say, no, I don't seek those status games. That's a <laughs> status game in and of itself. Yeah. Well, it, it, it isn't a paradox. I would say it's delusion and it's a powerful one because it's because subconsciously it's all about status and religious status games are so nakedly about status i mean you, you know um just 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 e even you know in buddhist environments the way the way people behave around the dalai lama i mean the dalai lama is constantly coming out with these greetings card level you know truisms these banal you know <laughs> sayings and and really smart people go you know quote them oh oh the, as the dalai lama says you know he who sleeps most works best or whatever it might be yeah. and, and you know and, and you, you look at the way that people behave around the Dalai Lama I mean he is treated as an extremely high status individual and I expect he expects to be treated like an extremely high status individual um you know for an earlier book it was called the heretics in the UK uh, it, it, internationally it was called the unpersuadables I spent um 10 days a kind of hardcore um, Buddhist meditation retreat in the Blue Mountains in Australia. And, and there was that dynamic going on there where everybody was busy doing 16 hours a day of meditation to destroy their ego. And uh, and um, uh, uh, th there was this kind of guru character who would kind of float in uh, with his robes on and kind of declaim to us for, for, for ages about what we were doing um, and, and, you know, all the Buddhist kind of context around it. And and me just sort of being ignorant and, uh, and unfit, I, I wasn't kneeling down. I was sitting on on the carpet with my feet towards him, yeah. and I was and I was given a note and pulled out, and he and I was given this bollocking by him because um, he was so insulted that the soles of my feet were facing him, and he was outraged by this act of you know uh, <laughs> disrespect, which I had no idea that I was doing, and and I just you know at, at the time when he I felt mortified, and embarrassed, and like oh my god. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. But afterwards, I got quite cross because, like, are you, uh, how unself aware are you that you've just been lecturing us about the destruction of the ego? And yet, you've seen fit to humiliate me. Um, you're so kind of distressed by this, by the distant sight of the soles of my feet. So, you know, so that is a status game. And that is an individual who is living this story in which he is above, above the earthly desires that the rest of us have. But actually, is it, 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 everything that he's doing it tells you and every way every way that he's behaving every way that people are behaving around him tells you that he's deeply interested in his own status people who who perceive or believe they have higher status also reap some amazing health rewards some uh, like you mentioned previously reproductive rewards evolutionary rewards and would you care to expand on why is this like happening and how is this happening that people who attain high status have longer metrics of life versus those who are on the bottom of the food chain yeah sure so so so, so, so as you say you know you know I, i think one of the big um things the book has made me realize is that status is is not a bad thing to seek in fact it's it's a great thing to seek as long as you do it mindfully and 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 understanding that it's this chimera this this thing that you're never going to finally achieve this is endless game um but it's very good for us it's good for our mental health you know I, it, it, it gives our lives meaning if you think about the greatest meaning most meaningful moments in your life 
they're going to be either about connection which is you know love and, and and which is all the important stuff the book isn't about or it's going to be about status is it going to be that time when you scored the goal or you know aced the exam or got the job or you know whatever you know something where you were just amazing and it and then everybody was applauding you and all that stuff that's the stuff we love it you know so it's, it's some of our greatest moments um are, are are deeply rooted in status um but the health thing is really interesting so so there was a there was a um set of studies in in britain sort of major studies called the whitehall studies and in and over here in the UK, Whitehall is the civil service. It's the machinery of government. So it's so it's a huge, huge um, bureaucracy. Um, it's highly stratified. Um, uh, so very, very hierarchical. And so these researchers went in to measure people's ho- health outcomes um, and compare them to where they. And they found that the, 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 the higher they were in the hierarchy, the the better their health outcomes. The lower their um, morbidity um, and, and so the obvious thing to think is well that's of course because the because rich people can eat salad and get a personal trainer and poor people are eating burger king and you know but, but that's not true it's very simplistic uh, and it's also just not true in that study so so, so you know th- so the person at the very top if that person was a smoker the still extremely wealthy person one slot beneath that person who was a smoker w- would be more likely to s- s- die as a result of their smoking than the person at the top so it was it was and it was really significant changes as they went down the hierarchy wow. and so they found this um also in the lab in baboons so, so 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 what they did is they took all these baboons and they fed all these baboons this horrific uh, but delicious sounding fast food diet um, so they got really unhealthy, these baboons, and they, they, they were full of, um, ath- they, you know, they, they were for atherosclerotic pr- plaques, so very, very at risk of heart disease and that kind of thing. And, and they found that just like in Whitehall, the higher the monkey, the baboon was up the hierarchy, the less likely they were to die as a result of their bad diet. But importantly, when they when they conspired to change the hierarchy, they somehow changed the hierarchy. So now there was a different baboon at the top. The health outcomes changed the lockstep with a change in hierarchy mm-hmm. so it definitely was the hierarchy that was having these effects and these effects in, the, in humans are independent of gender age um they've fa- been found in different classes in different cultures they're independent of exercise you know when you strip away all the confounds like exercise personality all that stuff they're still there and and and, and so the reasons are speculative but it's thought that um it's because your subconscious brain is constantly um measuring your status vis-a-vis everybody else like it never switches off you know some neuroscientists call it the status detection system you know that that's why you get road rage because because you're you, you know your brain is constantly constantly measuring your status and measuring everything that happens to you as a as a marker of status and if somebody cuts you up on the road it's not like oh that's a naughty driver i could have had a crash it's like that fucker you know you, you take it immediately as a, an act of disrespect that's the status detection system and so um so so if you're so it's you our perceived level of status is always being measured and if the brain figures that that we are kind of lower down the hierarchy it's going to decide well i'm in a state of um emergency here things are not good um so that means i'm going to have to do a couple of things um basically prepare myself for um um, a disaster and so so when the when the body prepares itself for a disaster it goes into a state called inflammation and inflammation um as you may already know is fine in the short term like if you're going to be beaten up or attacked by a lion inflammation is great but in the long term it's very very bad for you and so that's what probably leading to all the health outcomes and it also lowers your antiviral response so lowering antiviral response is good for reasons that are too complex for me to understand um but but, but again it prepares you for short-term physical assault but long-term obviously having a lower antiviral response is bad because it makes you more vulnerable to viruses so, so 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 that's what they think is going on and and uh, and there's there's some really famous research that's found the same thing with loneliness again i mentioned you know, connection is the other thing that's really important to humans connection and status connection isn't it isn't what the book is about but there are lots of great books about a connection that that, affect, that that are that talk about the same thing that being lonely um it, it is you know that, that, i mean yeah, being lonely is, is 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 very bad for your health for the same reasons because the, the brain's reading is a signal that things are going wrong in your life yeah like you argue in the status game is we've come thousands of years hundreds of thousands of years in the making being tribal societies and of course like you say we've always kind of have this radar to compare ourselves to others and also 
look where we are in the in the food chain and also compared to our peers and how can we improve upon on ourselves and into your idea of status making machines i love how you make the distinction between we're not meaning making machines we're status making machines in your book which is amazing and there is this connotation like you you said that Every time we think about status games and, for example, me accepting that I'm playing a status game, it's usually on a negative side. And at the yeah. first, when I first noticed this about me, I, I felt disappointed, like, hey, I'm, I, I want this, <laughs> this job title. I want this, yeah. you know, this college degree for, for just the recognition. And I felt like disappointed about myself. But then reading your book is like, there's no way out of it. We're built for this. We'll be for this. It's like... We're just this body that life is trying to use, so it creates more life. And the cheat code for the for it is status. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's that, that's brilliantly put. And and, and, and yeah, it's um, I, I I think it's part. You know, p people do feel they're, they're very resistant to this idea, especially you know, I'm a, I'm a left wing person, especially on the left. You know, left wing people really hate this idea um of um status games um the guardian newspaper um declined to review the book they were planning on reviewing it they were planning on running an extract from it and then they read it and went this one's not for us <laughs> so <laughs> but i was grateful for them not to uh dis to, to run a very negative review critical review which they could have done so but so so yeah i mean so people on the left they, 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 they like books like humankind which say oh no humans are all about kindness and um at love and and actually i mean i, I find it's very simplistic but it's also it's also a misunderstanding of uh, it, 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 it's a kind of a one-eyed view of what status is and i and i think you know it, it's, it's difficult to kind of understand why there is undoubtedly a universal um um, um disapproval of the idea of status I, I i i think it's something to do with the fact that we are also status obsessed that that if somebody else is status obsessed we take it as a kind of um we take it as a kind of a warning you know we don't like them because it's like that's a rival now uh, and so, so so we probably i don't know if evolved is the right word technically but we've developed this kind of aversion to admitting it i mean th th there's lots of really interesting research um i think he's robert trivers that talks about how the self is this performance that's that's developed to that's developed to perform in the um, tribal context, you know, and John Jonathan Haidt writes a lot about morality and about how we're not moral people. We've evolved to perform uh, mm. as a, we're not interested in our own morality. We're interested in presenting as a moral person. And I think it's related. I think, I, th I think we've, we've evolved to present as somebody that oh, I don't, I'm just a good person. Uh, you know, I just love uh, what I do, you know, we've, uh, because, because it, it's strategically smart for us to deny our desire for status because it's just going to trigger everybody around us and, and and create all this rivalry that's my pocket theory about it but but it's just a it's the best i can do <laughs> no, and it's, it's really interesting because you know we live also in in a world where i also want to touch this topic but it was later on but we live in a world where we're we have these pandora's box of technology of social media i know you've written uh, another book regarding selfies, the selfie era, yeah. and it's it's such a weird place to live in where we're just the self-enforcing mechanisms of of status games before social media were not that instant, and now we're playing also a game against ourselves. You know, the image we I'm portraying about myself in mm -hmm. social media, and it's just this instant feedback between who I want to portray, who I who I want to show, and also not knowing. You, you know, the, these coping mechanisms of co-playing the games with other people. It's, if I put a post that says this post was carefully uh, portrayed to show status and to achieve more status, no one will like the post. But if I say, I'm glad to join this new workforce <laughs> because it will lead me to new pathways, everyone's going to like it because we're virtue signaling. So it's, yeah. you say, like, it's this under under narrative undercurrents of playing the status game without saying it yeah and, and, that, and that's what social media is i mean in the book as you know i write about the, there's three main human games yeah. there's dominance games which is the animalistic millions of years old stuff aggression 
pushing people around, forcing other people to attend to you in status and to respect you and your beliefs and your games and all that stuff. There's virtue, which is um, I'm a good person. Mm. So, you know, the Dalai Lama, as we talked about earlier on, is a, is a virtue game superstar, a virtue game celebrity. So is Michelle Obama. So is the Pope. You know, so was the Queen when she was still alive. These aren't people who are famous because of their competence, yeah. they're, they're, um, because they're good at something. They're, they're, they're famous because of their perceived virtue. And then there's the success game, the Elon Musk game, the Jeff Bezos game, the Serena Williams game. You know, th these people who become, you know, the Gordon Ramsay game. These people become super famous because they're extremely good at something. Um, and so, so, so dominance, virtue, and success. That, that's how. That's the, those are the main ways. I mean, the other, the other obvious one that I don't really write about because it's boring is beauty. You know, youth and beauty is, is a way of earning status, but it's it's kind of it comes and it goes, unfortunately, yeah. um, uh, and it's not particularly interesting. Um, but, so, but 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 even with that, social media is all about those games, dominance, virtue, and success, and, and yes, beauty. You know, that's a big part of it too. Um, but, but uh, you know, and that's what you see. So, so so you know, what what happens when you connect literally billions of people together is they instantly start playing status games in, in that recognizable way of dominance, virtue, and success. And I think the problems come, you know, as you say, partly because they're so easy. So so so, so that. You know, competence games are hard. You've got to become good at something. You've got to impress people who are already trying, who, then, who they themselves are trying to be good at that thing. Success games are really hard. Dominance games, you've got to be tough. You know, you've, you've got to have either physical strength or strength of personality. So some people can play dominance games. Some people can't. I think a lot of that is down to personality and upbringing. Um, but virtue games are easy on social media. All you've got to do to win some virtue status is have a little pop at somebody mm. um, who, who, who you and your your um, virtue game collective think are low status. So you have a pop at that person, and you and oh yeah, brilliant! Wow, well, oh, the hot take. And so it's, it's literally you can or you know even liking a tweet, you know you can you can feel a bit more virtuous. And and so so, so I think that's why why um, well I, I'm sure that's why social media has become so universally and instantly successful. I mean, the, the last statistic I saw was that there are more than 4 billion people around the world. That's more than half the population of the world. And when you think about the amount of people in the world who haven't got smartphones or access to computers or, or who are too young or you know too old, that's amazing that it's 4 billion. Um, you know, so, so it has to be something there that is that, 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 that completely connects with our universal fundamental human nature and i think it's status you know like like social media platforms their lifeblood is the generation and maintenance and the playing with of status upon reading your book the status game i was scrolling on linkedin <laughs> and you know you found on linkedin all of these posts where said i'm excited to join this company and thank you to this person the other person and it's just this Virtue signaling that instantly gives you access to this hierarchy where, you know, you're climbing the ladder, so to say, and it creates unconsciously and consciously this from, from the perspective side, hey, they're playing the game better than me. Even if I didn't study engineering, wow, the yeah. engineer is yeah. a Tesla, <laughs> which is crazy. So, and another mind-blowing idea on your book is, you know, the slot machine that is social media and mm. having this instant access to this instant access to being on top of the hierarchy you know which could have been before social media could have been in 20 25 years of climbing the corporate ladder but now you know you're just using the slot machine and praying it works and when it works it just explodes yeah i mean uh, that th that was um one of the most interesting books that I read as part of my research. There's a, there's a guy called BJ Fogg, who is a yeah. Stanford psychologist, who in 2003 published his book called Persuasive Technology. And it was quite a, it was quite a thing. Um, like he predicts the smartphone like perfectly in that book. So this is two, so it's published in 2003. So he'd be writing it 2001, 2000, well, 2000, 2001. And it takes a year to publish a book usually. And, and he describes this um, machine it's going to be about a deck of cards and it's your organizer it's internet access and people are going to carry it around and they're going to feel quite lost without it mm -hmm. so he can he completely described he has the iphone already invented in his head it's amazing 
And then he asked the question, so how can we make these things persuasive? How can we use these things to um, uh, influence people's beliefs and behavior, change people's beliefs and behavior? And so he has all these ideas. And one of them, because, you know, he wrote the book in the early days of the Internet. So he's lo- he's looking at stuff that already works on websites and he's looking at things like eBay and and the ratings that you give give per particular buyers, and he calls these things micro suasion like um, um, things, like these little points that you can get. And then he says um, the way to make this compulsive, the way to really get people kind of almost addicted to this stuff, is is to make those rewards um, um, unpredictable. So 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 he says the re- he said the reason that slot machines are um, addictive is because they have unpredictable rewards you never know what you're going to get you're going to you put your you put your dollar in you pull the slot the, the arm and then you don't know what's going to happen and and then because you don't because it could be the next time i'm going to get it the next time so the rewards are inconsistent and it is you can do the same thing with these micro suasion elements on websites and and put them on the phone it, or you can call it a phone the device i think you'd, yeah and um and that's exactly what happened you know um he ended up um uh, running this kind of now very famous course at Stanford. Um, and, and I think, I think it was the first time he ran it, a 10 week course. And by the end of the 10 week course, they were, they, they were making Facebook apps and, and, and these students were millionaires by the end of it, that their apps had been so instantly successful. So, 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 he, so, but, but what I thought was really interesting in all this, reading all this literature and, you know, there, there's been a Netflix documentary that talks about this is that nobody seems to have figured out what you're actually gambling with. Like, Yes, it was a slot machine, but you're gambling with status. That's what you're gambling with. Every time you make um, a contribution to any social media website, um, you're putting your you're putting a bit of your status on the line. And sometimes um, you lose, and people go, "Oh, this is a shit take, mate," or whatever. Most of the time, you just get ignored, and that's a bit depressing. But you know, it's fine. But sometimes it goes wild, and 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 you know, pe- people uh, obviously, I don't need to tell you, but, but you know, lots of people on social media have become wildly rich and famous and influential because of their excellent play on that slot machine. So, 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 so that's why I felt was this kind of important missing piece from all this um, Silicon Valley um, theory, you know, psychological theory, which is the, 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 actually what are these people gambling with? And to me, it seems very clear that it's status. But one of the questions that I've always been weighing in my mind upon reading your book is that there's this and maybe like you say it's because of we don't really like uh accepting that we're playing a dominance game quote unquote but it seems that the status games are built to be a zero-sum game they're built for Mm -hmm. me to be on top and for someone else to be lower in the ladder it's it's this tension between trying to competitively increase my own status, but that's on the expense of others. So Will, do you think that, is there any way that we can rig this evolutionary code so it stops being a zero zone game and it just enhances more and more people or it's just that, that's- me Yeah, there is idea. totally. And, and actually, the, the, you know, the, the, this is where I think that, the, you know, the people on, on the left are, are, are more correct. So when you look at hunt, the hunter-gatherer groups in which we evolved, um, they they they're sometimes called egalitarian. They're more, much more egalitarian than than post um, um, you know post agriculture communities because as soon as we settled down, we we, we had lots of private possess- we had much more private possessions. We had accumulating wealth. We had people owning land. So so suddenly you could mark your status with all this very powerful stuff. But um, so so. Um, yeah, so so in those pre-modern groups, they were much more egalitarian, but they were they, they were still status gains, but they, but they were also much much less zero sum. And one of the things that really surprised me was that um, it was very unusual to have a leader, an actual leader in those pre-modern groups. So what would happen was you'd have this kind of loose um, collection of elders that sometimes. Are referred to as the cousins, not they're not literally the cousins, but these kind of elders that would gather together to make important decisions. But even when they're making important decisions, it's very rarely one person that's making that decision. And even when an important decision is made, there, there would always be the um, attempt to create um, a sense of um, conformity and uh, agreement around the group before anything happened, even though 
I think in reality, people would agree because they felt under pressure as, as they would in you know, almost a totalitarian group. Like if you cross the cousins, you're, you're in trouble. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, deadly trouble. So, 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 so it's not quite as straightforward um, as you might think where, where the, you know, human groups are not these awful kind of hunger games competitions uh, where, where everyone at the bottom is dead and everyone at the top is rich. Like that's, that's capitalism actually and, and monarchy. And, you know, that, 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 that's, that, that's not the correct and so in the book, I talk about these different kinds of status games that we see in, in the modern world. And I think like the worst version that I talk about is um, Enron, you know, the famously corrupt group Enron. And so Enron is, 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 a, is a horribly designed status game or was. Um, they had this system called Rank and Yank where um, every it was either six months. It could have even been every three months. I forget. You, you know, the, the the senior leadership team would sit down and go through every single person who worked from Enron and put them in a ranking. And the people in the in the top, say, 20 percent would get a pay rise. The people in the middle would be terrified and the people at the bottom would be out. And so that's horrible. That that creates a terrible um, um, culture because status is really hard to come by. Uh, you know, status we offer other people, and this is dominance. We, you know, we, we it comes from other people. So, in an unhealthy organization, status is really hard to come by. It's completely zero sum. Uh, so, everybody, everybody's just desperately looking after their own status and never giving any out themselves, which means there's in hardly any supply. So that's bad. You don't want to do that. And you know, and Enron. That's why they they became the most corrupt company in the world because people became so desperate to earn status they would do anything and then they started breaking every law they could you know get, come across in order to make it so the opposite um weirdly the opposite of enron is crossfit so crossfit is the kind of very popular um but you know i think it started in california the keep fit regimen and so what's really interesting about crossfit groups is it's just like going to the gym or having a personal trainer but it happens in a group context uh, and, 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 they're, and they're very um, cleverly designed. I don't think, I think, I think they just happened upon this perfect design. I don't think they were studying evolutionary psychology, <laughs> but, but CrossFit groups are small, just like um, hunter gatherer groups were small. Um, they're also um, kind of um, egalitarian in the sense that, 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 um, they have these things called wads, workouts of the day. So you turn up to your CrossFit group with all your all the all the usual people there, and on the board you'll see this is the workout of the day. This horrible hard thing that you've got to get through: lifting weights, running certain blocks. But it's not like a zero sum thing where here it is and the winner is at the top. It's like it, it, it all depending on your level of fitness, it changes. Um, so if you're like me and middle aged you know you're not gonna have to work as hard as somebody your age if, if you're at crossfit so so it takes away that that element of um competition the other thing about crossfit is that is that it has this culture of maximal um kind of celebration of each other so everybody is aware of, of where everybody else is on their journey of getting fit and there's just a huge amount of come on you can do it you know it's very un-english <laughs> all this stuff you know celebration pushing on and when academics have actually studied the psychology of, of CrossFit, they found that this is what gets people addicted. It's this kind of, um, it, it's, the, it, it's the sense that everyone cares about everybody else. Everyone is encouraging everybody else and pushing everybody else on. And, and there's, a, there's this like the opposite of Enron, where it's this kind of culture of everybody giving out as much status as they possibly can because everybody wants everybody else to win. So, so you know, th there are limits to that. Um, it's not egalitarian because you can guarantee that in any CrossFit group, everyone's going to know who the most fit and healthy is. And they're all going to like, well, I wish I was that person, you know, but, 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 uh, but I feel that that's the maximally functional version of a human group CrossFit. It, uh, and, and the results are, it speaks for itself. I mean, people are not a CrossFitter, but people who join, I, I've, I've reported on CrossFitters and they are like a cult members that, you know, they, they, people talk about CrossFit absolutely changing their lives and, and, yeah, and, and I believe it, and I think it's because it's the CrossFit is a, is a, is a, is an almost perfectly functional status game. Wow, yeah, those those two those two examples were mind blowing, and now are even more. And it also made me think on I don't know if you're familiar with Ray Dalio and Bridgewater Associates. He created this company 
well, a hedge fund. He's, it's one of the biggest in the world. Mm. And he's not really like, he didn't try to use the end run approach towards moving his company. Of course, it, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't exist as the biggest right now, but he implemented an idea meritocracy where mm. people who have the best ideas are those ideas already implemented. And so everyone has like this player card where they see the rankings of other people in terms of their abilities. So five for intuition, four for, you know, pragmatism, three for practicality and two for writing, for example. And everyone mm. has these, these cards upon their, their peers. And a lot of people quit. A lot of people can't stand it. But he argues that for really like the next step for us is to build an idea meritocracy, which is basically a status game. I have a better idea than you. We're going to yeah. put it in clash and let's see which one builds. So it's interesting to, to think on these games and. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I, that's fascinating. I, I mean, I, I, it's funny. It's, it's one of those coincidences, like literally yesterday, somebody said, have you heard of Ray Dalio? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I never had. So, so I, 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 all I know, I've seen it. He's got this um, viral movie on YouTube, 23 million views. Yeah. So, I was watching. So, so, so I know who he is now, but I had no idea about this. This is um, really interesting. If he, has he got a book or like, where, yeah. where is he? Yeah. Yeah. He has a book. It's called principles and I can send the information for you to, to look on it. It's just really interesting. And he literally, he argues that everything has to be upon radical truth and radical transparency. So like wow. it's, it's less of like, you know, trying to keep your heart, your cards, you know, folded. It's just opening your card, saying whatever you need to say. And then a feedback loop. Okay, this didn't work. It did work. And like he says that upon 18 months where people enter the, the workplace, Bridgewater, most of them fail to stay and those who stay excel. So it's really wow. interesting because that in and of itself is a status game. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but he's also, it also is like a filter, isn't it? Where where he, where he's filtering out the people who can handle it. Yeah, Like he wants tough people who are, extremely interested in status but are not it sounds like not not narcissistic you right. know i i think a lot of people who are extremely interested in status are narcissistic they, they're kim kardashian they're Meghan markle or whoever um but, but but narcissistic people couldn't handle that what you're describing at all could they because they'd, they'd be just furious infuriated right. so it sounds like a kind of a brutal but really savvy way of getting an elite team because you've got this combination of people who are extremely interested in, in 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 success but also humble enough to take a beating yeah like, <laughs> so so yeah i mean wow that I'm, i will definitely read that it's yeah thank you for the tip yeah it's super interesting and i would love to hear your thoughts on on it because you know it's this again it's people who there is this also another paradox that i think is people who tend to not seek status like we've talked about those who signal I don't want status really are looking status for themselves. But let's say Kobe Bryant, for example, he was yeah. one of the best basketball players of all time. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in it because of the rewards in terms of, you know, recognition and whatnot. That was like an externality. That was a, an aftershock mm -hmm. of his greatness in and of itself. Seeking greatness is a status game, but this there's, I feel this cohort of people who receive the they reap the rewards of of status without mm -hmm. acknowledging the game of status am i am i making sense yeah a bit i mean i i i think one of the things that's interesting to think about is that you know i i think one of the things that people get wrong about status is is they always think they think that status means that people always want to seek the, the you know the um acclaim of the entire world uh, but actually, most people playing status games, they just want to. They're interested in their peers. So, that, so um, but, but by which I mean other players in their status game. So, 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 uh, and I work as a ghostwriter as well as I write my own books. I wrote books for other people, and some of my clients in the past have been extremely successful, well-known people who are driven beyond belief. Like when I work with them, I realize 
that's why I'm never going to be a millionaire like you because you will you, you you know you will give everything you will never take no for an answer you want to work 14 hour days like something like like you know they they push you uh, sometimes to kind of to, to, to the edge of a breakdown with their you know and what I've realized about these people um is yes that they are talented because you have to have talent to succeed in any domain but really you know i would say 75% of the reason they are who they are is because they've got that incredible need to to win and and that is the status thing but the other thing about these the, the interesting about these people is that they're not even though they are fabulously rich they're not interested in money they're not bothered about money the money is taken care of by the money people and you know um they're they're genuinely interested in what they do they love what they do they're passionate about what they do so they're not that interested um in um the acclaim of the wider world what they really care about is winning against that rival over there and that slightly more famous person and what does that person who i used to work with think about me now you know just like we all are so so uh, and i think but i think what you're describing is there's a narrow class of people who 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 just want the acclaim of the whole world and I, and I think, I, I don't think that's many of us. Uh, those are the people that end up becoming celebrities. Uh, they're definitely the people that end up becoming musicians, uh, you know, because being a musician is a really easy way to, well, I'd say it's easy. It's not easy. It's never easy to become famous. But, but you know, especially, you know, and I think actors, uh, you know, I, I think in those kinds of professions where you're you're on a stage looking at an audience of thousands and they're screaming at you i think those are the people <laughs> who, 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 who i mean the amount of um musicians that you hear uh, and they admit that the reason they picked up a guitar when they were guitar when they were 14 was because they wanted girls i mean you just, just, you just hear it over and over again so uh, and and now in in social media i, I think that, that that they're influencers you know I, and i think i i, I also think that's why music and film and culture is is not what it once was because i think a lot of the young people that would have gone into those arts in my generation and are on the internet now um being youtubers or or, or whatever you know it's, it's just what you do these days to 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 get that kind of acclaim and again it's not to say that that, that these people are talent free because that's that's not what i'm saying at all but but i'm saying it's that their dial is up you know they have a higher need for you know status the most as do i which is why i'm you know pursued the career of a of a writer which is not something that's going to earn you huge amounts of money i'm right now at an, at an age where the status games are really being thrown out to me you know this hey alex you gotta get your shit together <laughs> you gotta put your career on and you gotta you gotta choose your lane so to say yeah and one of the biggest questions i had for you will is you know, we've. I'm now aware of, of the status games we play. I'm now aware of, you know, some of the underpinnings of my intentions or, you know, the evolutionary reasons behind my choices. So do you think there is a way or how, how would you say there is this, is there a recipe to appropriately choose the status game one wants to play in life? Or because there's... Also, this idea that you argue that they take life for themselves and like it's a, this inertia of life that just throws you to play the games of life. So, yeah. So, 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 so the only thing I'd say is that you, is that is that you, you have to, as, as far as you can, um, forget about money and all that and all that stuff and just lean into what you're good at. You know, because because ultimately you're going to win at the games at which you can offer more value than the average player and it's as simple as that if you're going to offer more value than the average player then you're going to win uh, uh, there's nothing more tragic than seeing somebody that's desperate to become um, x y or z and just you just think they're never gonna they're never gonna make it i mean when i was your age and i was a young journalist i got loads of um interest from tv companies that want to put me on tv um, like Louis Theroux was big at the time. I think they wanted me to be the next Louis Theroux, <laughs> but I was awful. I was just terrible. At, at, I just couldn't do telly, you know, like I just wasn't confident enough. Um, yeah, I think that was it. You know, I just didn't have the confidence. And, and I think um, a lot of TV people have a public school background where you're taught like public speaking and things. And so for ages, I used to like, oh, you know, I had all these, the BBC, you know, everybody was filming me. I had these, did these, you know, this, all these opportunities and I blew them all. 
but but it's only after sort of doing this research that I realised that, that, that it was like not a choice that I made to fail at those status games. It would have been great to have ended up being a big TV star. It would have been a very interesting life, you know. Um, but but I just can't. I couldn't do it. So so so, so it's like um, and I, the, the the good thing that I did was just give up. Like I, I like I had a TV agent who. Uh, for one, for a while, I had the same agent as um as uh, Ricky Gervais. Believe it or not, he fired me. He had me for about wow. six months, and when everything kept, kept going wrong, he, he fired me. He, actually, he got his assistant to fire me. He didn't even do it himself, uh, and it was I was really upset, obviously. But 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 um. But it was, but I was shit. <laughs> uh, and the mistake would have been to just think, no, no, you know, I'm going to carry on. I must be a big TV star. I mean, and so thank God I didn't do that. And I just thought, well, I'm just going to be a writer then. And so, so that's what I'd say to you is that is that is that is that is that the most important thing is that is that it's something that you're good at because that because that's what's going to bring you the most happiness in the long term. You know, it isn't like 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 if you're if you're presented with a fork in the road and one fork is like I, mine was big TV star, lots of money, you know, gorgeous women or whatever, whatever it, the promise felt like it was at the time. Um, and something that's a bit less glamorous and a bit less reliable in terms of income. It doesn't matter because it re- it sounds banal, but it's it's completely true. It isn't the income that will make you happy in the long term. It's the status. And if you're good at that thing, you're going to become well known in that world in that game and if you become well known in that game you're going to have a great life <laughs> you know that, that, that that's kind of how it works you're going to you're going to feel like your life has meaning and purpose and interest and so so that that that's all i'd say you know lean into what you're good at yeah thank you that's really useful and especially now because as you say there's forks in everyone's lives and your book came into a really pivotal point in my life so I'm leaning into your <laughs> advice <laughs> and I'm also interested in, you know, kind of hedging this, this path that I will embark on. And you mentioned some of the, some of the hidden costs or hidden traps there is to every single status gaming. One of the biggest ones for me, and I believe for you too, because you wrote a whole, whole chapter on it is the flaw, the yes. big famous flaw is that. Yeah, I would love love you to describe what is the flaw, and is there any antidote for the flaw? Yeah, so the the, the flaw is basically that we never we can never have enough status. So so so, so, so you know, I, I said before that the subconscious reality of life is it's a, it's a game, uh, but 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 we live in a story. We feel like it's a story. That's our experience as a story, and the story stories have happy endings. And and one of the ways that story deludes us all the time is it says, if, you know, once I get to this thing, I'm going to be happy. So there was this hilarious, I loved it, this study that they did where, that, where, 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 where a psychologist got all these bunch of really super wealthy people, like multimillionaires and above, and said, how much money um, would you need to be have in order to be perfectly happy? And consistently, they said two to three times much as money as I've got now, and I'll be perfectly happy. And it's like, man, <laughs> you're not going to be perfectly happy. And so that's the floor. It's like we imagine that we're going to be happy. Like if you'd have told me when I was, you know, 18, that you're going to be an author and you're going to be interviewed by Alex, I'd be like, oh, great. That, that sounds amazing. But, you know, of course, I'm just thinking, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's, I'm not satisfied now. I want the, I want the next book to be better. And, um, uh, you know, so, so yeah, that's the floor. And so, so, so managing it is, it's just, I think a lot of it is about, um, is about realizing that it's there and, and you, you, you've got to, I think you've got to, even though it's something, it does often feel deadly serious. You, you've got to think of your status games with a certain kind of humor because it is, they are ridiculous. Like it, the things that we're driven to do for, you know, in terms of status are ridiculous, you know, like, we're like, like, and, and so, so I, I think, it, I think it's just, just, just the only advice would be just to be aware of it. And in, in in the event, and who knows that you do become super famous like Kanye West, be really aware of it because I think I, th I think it becomes extremely dangerous when, um, you know, human brains haven't designed to have Kanye West um, or uh, you know Elon Musk levels of status. They just haven't, and so it's no surprise when people like Kanye West and Elon Musk and Madonna be another example um, start behaving in ways which are just. I mean, Elon Musk isn't there yet, but 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 you know, are kind of batshit 
B- yeah. Because they've because they, I, I you know I think they they have been driven crazy by status because their brains are doing what brains do and saying yes I deserve all this status but of course they don't is the amount of status these people get is in, in, insane and and so 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 I think that's the other thing is so if you ever become like a global megastar just be careful <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're not fit to understand that there's more than 200 million people watching to 400 eyeballs pairs of eyeballs watching every single move we make it's just yeah. insane yeah. will it's just been i've i've took a lot of time from you but you know i could be talking more and you know for 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 years about your book which is just outstanding i have five pages worth of questions and to just to wrap up the your yeah. last chapter is the seven rules of the status game and you mentioned there's these awesome traits that you give out, you know, we've been talking about advice and how can we really win the status game is the, you know, you mentioned the flan being aware of it, but yeah. Well, okay. So, so, so first as you think you've got to understand that it's, that it's just a game and, and it is, and honestly, that's been life changing for me because even though I still get frustrated and disappointed and, you know, all of that stuff, like everybody gets, there's now this, this always this kind of top note of, ah, this is stupid. It's just a game, you know, like, like I, I like I can't take, um, even though, I, you know, I, I haven't stopped working as hard as I've always worked. I, I understand now that it's, it's kind of ridiculous and, uh, you know, it's just status is, is something that I say to myself all the time now to kind of comfort myself. So I, th- I just think, you know, making that unconscious stuff conscious is really powerful. It gives you a, it gives you a real, a, a really kind of wise sense of yourself when you're looking at watching your own behavior, often in your most ridiculous moments. And um, the, the other thing I think is really important is to, is to hedge, you know, I, I, like, I, like, um, I think it's important to play multiple games and have multiple sources of status. I think it's less important at your age. I, I think, I, you know, it, it, if I was to, you, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, I imagine that in your 20s, in your teens and 20s and early 30s, it's, it's probably fine to just go in hard on one on one status game because that that's that, that's the age in which you are, you know, really rising up. Uh, and, but but I think once you hit middle age, once you get thirty five plus, you need to start diversifying your sources of status, because the the next crop of twenty somethings are, are snapping at your heels. You're getting older, you know. Really, you know, get, getting older is an assault on status, especially in the in the West, because you know your looks go, your stomach pops out, your hair falls out, your teeth start looking horrible. Like it's just a horrible, horrible thing, process that you're never quite prepared for. So, so, so even things like that, you you need other sources of status. And and I've you know I've done that. I, I've um, recently started volunteering for um, a charity. I, I've been doing it like six weeks now, and it's like I, I, when I go there, I, I really enjoy it, and it's like love it. And, and and I think it's because I've got this new game to play and this new identity and, and this new way of feeling valuable Well, I'm helping people now, you know, so, 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 so anything you can do, whether it's, uh, you know, getting like a lot of middle-aged people getting to keep fit cycling and all that stuff. That's really smart, not just for physical reasons, but for psychological reasons, you've got, you've got a new way of um, ascribing value to yourself. So, so, so yeah, I, th- I think hedging, especially when you get into your mid thirties and beyond play multiple games. I really want to thank you for writing your book, for joining me today. It's really, you know, an eye-opening book and your ideas really shed a light on what's worth doing while we play this game and what kinds of games we want to play and not shying away of our nature. You know, if our nature is built upon playing a status game, it's just acknowledging that that's happening, but not, you know, not being discouraged by it because, you know, we didn't talk about it in this episode. Your book clearly describes it. Lower status leads to lower status games leads to low health outcomes and unhappiness. But that's another episode in itself. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. No, thanks for a great conversation. Actually. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for reading the book. I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will add everything, you know, in the description. And of course, encourage everyone that's going to listen to this conversation or watch it to read it and also find will at twitter is your handle at will store 
W store. Yeah, W S T O R. Yeah. And also you have your website and also your books are in Amazon and I'll put yeah. everything on it. Fantastic. Thanks Alex. Thank you Will. <laughs>